Welcome to my home city of Liverpool. I'm Levi. Liverpool might be remembered for winning the Premier League, for the Beatles and people with a great sense of humour. But there is a darker side to this city. Slavery. By 1740, Liverpool had overtaken Bristol and London as the slave trading capital of Britain and dominated the slave trade more than any other port in the whole of Europe. The city became very wealthy from the triangular trade, which was the movement of goods and enslaved people between Britain, Africa and the Caribbean. 12 million Africans were deprived of status as human beings, kidnapped and sold as things. They were taken across the Atlantic Ocean and the conditions on the ships were terrible. Many did not survive the long journey. The enslaved people that did survive were forced into work camps called plantations to produce sugar, tobacco and raw cotton. The conditions were so awful that many enslaved people died doing this work. Ships then traveled back to Europe to sell the goods. Wherever you look, you can see the visible memory of Liverpool's involvement in slavery. From street names to buildings, the names of countless people who profited from the system have been printed into the city for hundreds of years. I'm on Sir Thomas Street, named after politician and businessman Sir Thomas Johnson. He became mayor in 1695 and was celebrated as the person who made Liverpool a major city because he expanded the port. This allowed the city to become very wealthy. This wealth was created through a heavy involvement in the slave trade. Sir Thomas was also directly involved in the slave trade himself and was one of the city's earliest slave, sugar and tobacco traders. I am in St. John's Gardens in the city center. Here you'll find a statue of William Gladstone. In 1868, he became Britain's Prime Minister. Whilst he's remembered for his role in politics, many have forgotten his family's connection to slavery. William's father, Sir John Gladstone, was a Scottish merchant, politician, and slave trader who lived in Liverpool. William Gladstone benefited from his father's wealth and tried to delay ending slavery. I'm outside Blackburn House in Liverpool's stunning Georgian Quarter. As you can see, it is a very impressive building. But the person who built it has not got such an impressive backstory. John Blackburn was mayor of Liverpool. In 1788, he arranged for Blackburn House to be built. He was one of the most powerful men in the city and his family were slave traders who owned a lot of land in and around Liverpool. But the history of this house took an interesting turn. Whilst it started off in the hands of slave traders, it was bought by George Holt in 1844. He was an abolitionist, which meant he campaigned for the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833, which made slavery illegal in some parts of the British Empire. He turned the house into Liverpool's first school for girls and the school's motto of togetherness and equality was very different from Blackburn's view on slavery. Born not for ourselves alone, but for the whole of the world. Welcome to Glasgow. I'm Graham. I'm Glasgow's first African-Caribbean councillor. Glasgow is a city in Scotland where 600,000 people live and it's known for music, and culture and of course are very warm and friendly people. But like a lot of cities in the UK, Glasgow has a darker side to its history. Glasgow was heavily involved in slavery. Glasgow's involvement was mainly focused on owning slaves, making money from the plantations and the sale of goods made by enslaved people, rather than slave trading directly. 
Everywhere you turn in Glasgow, you see the names of wealthy men who are remembered for their roles in engineering, charity, the art, politics, but their connections to slavery have all but been forgotten. The money generated by enslaved people allowed Glasgow's industries to grow and beautiful architecture to be built, which is still standing today. Black people are central to the story of our cities because their work helped to shape the buildings, culture and history. Here's a statue of James Watt. Uh, he's an 18th century inventor who modernized the steam engine. But as a difficult part of his past, which people don't really like to talk about. Watt's father was a slave trader and made money through the trade in slave produced goods such as sugar, rum and cotton. James and his brother John also bought enslaved people to sell in Scotland. James was so successful that he was on the back of a 50 pound note and Glasgow University even named a building after him but they got a lot of criticism for doing that. James Watt is a complicated figure because in later years he went on to reject slavery but his son went on to sell steam-powered equipment to plantations in the Caribbean and so the family profited from the system but in a different way. This is the area called Merchant City. Several streets in this area are named after 18th century tobacco lords who were a group of Scottish merchants who made fortunes trading in tobacco produced by enslaved people in the Americas and in the West Indies. I'm on Glassford Street, named after tobacco lord and slave owner John Glassford. The Glassfords owned many properties, including what was the Shawfield Mansion here in the city centre. There's a family portrait showing John Glassford and his family at the mansion. If you look closely, you can see the faint outline of an enslaved black boy that the family would have brought back to Scotland with them. I'm now outside Glasgow's Gallery of Modern Art, and as you can see, it's a pretty impressive building. But the man who built it has a not so impressive backstory. This was once the grand home of William Cunningham, who was a powerful tobacco lord who made a lot of money from the labor of enslaved people in America and the Caribbean. This iconic building was funded with money earned from the work of enslaved people on tobacco plantations. Hello, welcome to Bristol. My name's Esther and I'm a teacher here. Bristol is known for its thriving music scene, the iconic Clifton Suspension Bridge and world famous artist Banksy. But it's also a city with a difficult history. Slavery shaped modern Britain and we live with the memory of slavery today. Take a look at the beautiful old buildings in the city and at first you might not think much about how they were built but the profits generated by enslaved people's work funded these buildings. Many of the men who profited from slavery are still remembered in street names, statues and buildings throughout the city. I'm in Queen Square in Bristol City Centre, which was created as a green space for the rich Bristolians in the early 18th century. The square is surrounded by beautiful old townhouses. Located close to the harbour, it was a prime location and a home to lots of wealthy businessmen involved in slavery. Henry Bright was one of them. He became mayor of Bristol in 1771. He was responsible for 21 slaving voyages from the city. The Brights made a fortune from trading in enslaved people. They also owned plantations in Jamaica. Henry Bright lived here at number 29, where he kept an enslaved man who he had named Bristol. The Brights continued to be a rich and powerful family in the city. Henry's grandson, also called Henry, became MP for Bristol in 1820 and was born here at number 29. The great wealth the Brights made through slavery was passed down through the family for generations. One street away from Queen Square is Bristol's Old Vic Theatre. 
Built in 1766, this is one of the oldest theatres in the UK. Originally called the Theatre Royal, it was funded by 50 men, many of whom were slave traders, slave ship investors and plantation owners. Bristol's cultural scene began to grow as a direct result of the money made from slavery. This was once the site of a statue of Edward Colston. He was a slave trader in the 1600s and a director of a group called the Royal African Company, which transported about 80,000 enslaved men, women and children from Africa to the Caribbean and the Americas. It made him very rich and when he died in 1721, he left a lot of money to charities and good causes. He is recognised across Bristol. But some groups have been calling for the statue to be removed for many years. During a Black Lives Matter protest in June this year, demonstrators pulled down the statue and threw it into the harbour where the slave ships once were docked. This sparked a big debate about whether to remove, rename or reword the buildings, statues and streets in cities across the UK. So, what do you think? <laughs>